Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Humanities in Class um, webinar series uh, hosted by the National Humanities Center. Tonight's session and episode is titled Strong Men and Dictators, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Ruth Ben Giet from the New York University. Today is September the 9th. Um, hey, everybody, this is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center, and I want to welcome you. Uh, back to the webinar series. I appreciate you taking some time from your, your busy day, your busy uh, start to the school year. On behalf of my staff, Jira, Mike, and Meredith, I want to uh, let you know that we fully understand and appreciate uh, the disruptions that you're going through right now. And we hopeful, uh, we're hopeful that the work that we're providing is relevant and meaningful for you. Um, it's probably going to take a little time to figure out where the school year settles in, but if there's ways that we can support you in your curriculum development and your professional development or in the material that you share with your, your students, please do email me directly. Um, I'd also like to take a moment and directly uh, welcome and thank uh, some, of our, some of our participants tonight. I see that Emily is joining us from Anne Arundel up in the um, uh, northern Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. It's great to have you with us, Emily. Uh, Jennifer and Stephanie are with us from Ohio, although I think in probably different corners of the state. We're super pleased that you're with us. Uh, Tyler is joining us from the St. Francis School in Texas. Uh, Kate's joining us from Wisconsin. Danielle from Whitesboro, New York. And as always, we have a, a strong Los Angeles presence. Uh, Ariane, Kyle, and Patricia Sugman's in the room uh, from Los Angeles Unified. And we're really pleased uh, that you're able to join us tonight. I think it's um, indicative in some ways that uh, we began our new fellowship year at the center just a few days ago, like many of you did uh, in opening your classrooms and your buildings and welcoming in external guests potentially for the first time in quite a while. Um, the center closed uh, to the fellows about a year ago. Last year, we worked on a hybrid model where half of the fellows were with us in residence. The other half uh, worked remotely. This year, we've been cautiously optimistic and welcomed the 36 new fellows, the incoming class to the center uh, this past Tuesday. And in some ways, it does feel to me uh, a little bit like the start of the school year. You know, folks folks bring in their new trapper keepers and their new lunch boxes and, you know, walk with their feet forward so we can check out their new uh, school shoes. But really what I'm describing is the excitement to get back into a community like this and to be around interesting and dedicated uh, professional humanists who are really working hard to make sense of the complicated world that we live in. It was interesting to see many of you comment on the opening question tonight in which I asked for you to describe the qualities or the characteristics of a dictator. And many of the things that you said, I suspect you're going to hear a lot more about tonight, uh, things like narcissism and control and um, being self-absorbed and uh, being cruel and being mean-spirited. And in some ways, I think the humanities are, they, they are the antidote to those kinds of qualities, right? It's the humanities are about empathy and context and being able to relate to others in your community, other humans, because you understand yourself better and you're more self-aware. I think one of the things we try to articulate at the center uh, on a regular daily basis is that you know, these disciplines and the fields that we all feel strongly about and all of you teach to younger people, they're really not luxuries. They're not something to uh, just kind of do on the side when, uh, when math class is uh, finished and when other things are happening. It's an important part of the skill sets we have and the ways that we approach our world and the ways that we can counteract many of the qualities, negative qualities that, uh, that, you, um, that you dropped into the chat box. Um, as I always do, I'd like to encourage you to use the Humanities in Class Digital Library to find uh, more resources that connect that scholarly world of the center with your world, the classroom. Uh, that does include joining the webinar series group um, this is where you can find all of the resources associated with each session, both current and past. Um, this does include the, the readings and the resources that are provided by scholars. It also includes the recordings after the sessions. So if you'd like to go back and spend a little bit more time lingering on these topics or perhaps sharing some of the smaller segments of each, uh, each episode with your students, you're more than welcome to do so. That does, um, I would encourage you to also uh, go to the resource that's associated with tonight's session to get more background and more resources and readings for tonight's session. One of the nice things about the digital library as an open education resource uh, library is that not only is it free and open, but it allows the center to invite uh, other organizations that have very strong mission-driven work that uh, we respect and that we feel is um, are, are valuable assets to any teacher, to any instruction and to uh, make them available through the same platform. 
So in the digital library, you can search for the center's work, but also over 90 other organizations. And throughout the, the season this year, I'm going to be introducing you to some of those resources and inviting guests to appear just for a, a moment or two to share a little bit more about their organization. I suspect that some of uh, you know about these. Some of you, it might be brand new, but as teachers, it's always nice to be introduced to new materials. And tonight, I'd like to welcome Jesse Tanetta, who will be joining us uh, to share just a little bit about uh, the organization Echoes and Reflections. Hey, Jesse, can you hear me over on the East Coast? Yes, I can. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, thank you so much for inviting just for to show a couple of minutes about Echoes and Reflections and, and hopefully give you a few resources and idea of, of what this organization does and um, and hopefully help you in the classroom. So um, again, I'm Jesse Tanetta. I'm the Operations and Outreach Manager. I'm a former classroom teacher and I also have my master's degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, so it's definitely a passion of mine. Um, Echoes and Reflections is a partnership organization, so we are made up of the Anti-Defamation League, uh, the USC Shoah Foundation, and Yad Vashem. Um, and through that partnership, we were launched in 2005, and we have um, helped uh, about 85,000 teachers in the United States with um, professional development is our main focus. So um, we do in-person professional development programs um, when that was a thing, and then hopefully it, it returns to being a thing soon. Um, we also do virtual programs. We do webinars about six a month. Um, the, uh, we have two uh, asynchronous online professional development classes that um, are three weeks in length, about six to ten hours with graduate credit as uh, an option as well. We've also just launched um, shorter one-week classes that are focused on a specific agenda, so maybe focusing on refugees or media literacy or the book night. Um, and all of our curriculum, our, our video toolbox, and interactive timeline online, everything is open sourced. All of these options are free and, and supported by our generous donors um, and really just available for teachers to use. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight kind of our three kind of main ideas just to give you a, a quick snapshot um, without kind of taking up too much time or, or kind of diving into our website. But I'm going to throw um, the, the website link in the chat, but just to kind of give you three small images here. The, the top one is um, just a, a screenshot of one of our lesson plans. We have 10 historical lessons and one lesson on contemporary anti-Semitism. It includes uh, teacher instructions, activities. Um, it's uh, aligned to certain standards. It has uh, resources. Everything is, is free and open source. There are PDFs and um, graphic organizers and fillable PDFs that you can uh, download, download and send right to your students or put them in your learning management system. Um, testimony is a huge impact of that. Um, obviously, we utilize our partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation and have curated clips that you'll find throughout our units and embedded in our units for classroom use. And our last kind of resource that, that is really excellent and is student-facing is our timeline of the Holocaust that um, takes the years 1933 to 1945 and has uh, an incredible treasure trove of assets, photographs, testimony, informational videos, pictures, all those kinds of things. Um, again, everything free, online, ready to use into your classroom. Um, and so I would uh, encourage you all to, to see our website. If you have any questions or anything, you can certainly reach out to me directly and, um, and just kind of take a look at it and, and see our, our professional development offerings and, and our resources and see how they can help you in your classroom. So thank you so much for, uh, for including me in this. And I'm looking forward to learning alongside all of you tonight. Jesse, thanks so much for sharing that. And I will encourage Jesse to uh, remain with us for the evening and make comments in the audience chat, perhaps drop some links that are relevant to uh, what we're discussing or things that he'd like to share. So uh, again, Jesse, thank you for you and for the hard work uh, that you're doing at Echoes and Reflections. I do want to thank, uh, thank you. Um, I do want to mention that uh, many of you uh, seem to have a strong interest in history and uh, the teaching of history. And I hope that these webinars help make visible many of the topics that uh, you cover in your curriculum, but also give you some context. So when you're teaching other uh, uh, aspects of your curriculum, you can embed that knowledge. Uh, take a look at the upcoming webinar series. Um, Many of you have gone in, you've signed up for a lot of the sessions that you're interested in, but we are adding them on a pretty regular basis and our list will be updated. Uh, I particularly encourage you to take a look at some of the uh, sessions on the screen right now. Uh, they're filling quickly and I think there's going to be really uh, vibrant discussions with academics and professors about these uh, compelling topics. 
Finally, I want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council for all the hard work they do on behalf of the Center. Uh, we've welcomed them uh, this incoming class uh, just in the last month or so. These are educators all over the country who help help us, I think, stay in touch with um, the current state of the classroom, with the uh, the work that you're doing, help make our, our work relevant. Um, I can see several of you in the room tonight, Tisha, Kate. Uh, it's always fantastic. Stacy, I think, is here. It's always great to have you uh, join in these events. Um, and we want to uh, uh, thank you for the time that you've given us. Finally, uh, let me remind you how the webinars work. This is an audio only webinar, which means you'll hear our voices, but you won't see our faces. It's a nice break, I think, in the Zoom culture that we found ourselves in. But your participation is critical, and that occurs in the audience chat box in the lower right-hand corner. I'm sorry, the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please do uh, com make comments, um, you know, respond to each other, share links or resources. But if you have something that's more formal, something you'd like the professor to respond directly to, please drop that in the Ask the Professor tab, and that will come directly to me as the moderator. And when the time is right, uh, I'll pause things and we can uh, take some of your questions and your answers. On occasion, the Wi-Fi in your uh, home or your school might flicker, you might drop off, uh, your audio might come in and out. And if that's the case, I hate to say it, but the most common uh, response and the most common fix is to simply close your screen and come back in. That will not disrupt uh, our record of your time with us, and it will not disrupt anything else that's happening. But that seems to be the best way to kickstart it. There's also a, an audio uh, volume button just underneath the photograph. I think it's of me, actually. And you can adjust your, uh, your headphones as needed. So again, you have joined uh, the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's uh, session is titled Strong Men and Dictators. I'm joined by Professor Ruth Van Gatt from New York University. She's a professor of history and Italian studies. Uh, professor, can you hear me? Hello, Professor. We're gonna pause for a moment. By the way, this is what all of the teachers have gone through for the last year as you're waiting for the technology to kick in. Ruth, can you hear me? Well, that is one of those pauses that we're going to take a, a break. All of you are sitting on the edge of your seats waiting for Professor Ben Gatt to, uh, to, to say hello and to uh, connect with you. And now you're going to settle back into your seats just a little bit while we give her a chance to reconnect her audio. Let me um, pause with me, hang tight with me just for a second. See, don't see anything on my text. Hello, Ruth, can you hear me? Well, the good news is that Jesse and I are here. <laughs> Let me just uh, double check with uh, Professor, make sure that her audio didn't get kicked out. This system has really proven to be pretty bomb-proof. Um, it's very rare that we have issues. I can think of once or twice we've had a session that really got disrupted by bad connection or a storm or something. But in terms of broadcasting on a national and, in fact, international basis, as Rashid can tell us from Morocco, um, it actually is it is pretty seamless. But not seamless enough. Hey folks, thank you so much for being patient with me. And I attempt a couple of different communication uh, styles. And just to make sure that I'm not speaking to myself, I, I see Veronica is the last person in the chat box. Can you guys hear me? Can everybody in the room hear me? If so, uh, just give me a ping or a wave or a high five. Hey, Jesse, are you here? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Good old Ron Eisman. He's up there in uh, Vermont. Oh. So I see Ruth, hmm. So Ruth is still with us. She's present, uh, chatting with me in the top secret presenter chat box.
Jira's with it. Jira, thank you so much. Let's see where. Thomasine, you have no idea. I know that uh, you're up in Richmond, Virginia. As a native Virginian, it's always nice to see you folks with us. Ulysses, I see your question. We'll, we'll definitely uh, respond to that when we get a chance. Hmm. So, Ruth, uh, I see what's happened. So oh, just to the audience, now listen, this is this is what we're doing. We're brainstorming, I'm sorry, troubleshooting uh, Zoom and um, and technology together. But I can tell you what happened. Uh, Ruth and I are chatting in the presenter box, and she attached her AirPods, you know, thinking that that would be a good way to hear and to speak. And, of course, she's right, except when you attach your AirPods while you're already connected, it diverts the input-output, and, uh, and it shuts things down. So... Ruth, if you can hear me, I'm going to ask you to probably log out and come back in. Um, let's see. Hold on one second. And you guys are the most patient 186 people I've ever met. So look at Tisha hopping in there just like a teacher. Um, Tisha has asked a question for everyone. It's in the chat box. What do you think is the relationship between dictators and their supporters? Uh, Thomasine's already chimed in mission and loyalty. Fear, says Michelle. It's okay, Ruth. Uh, take your time. We're all going to laugh about this once we get you connected, and we can we can hear your laughter. Thanks, Jesse, for chiming in. Adriana, thank you. You're giving me that that ten minute uh, wait. I appreciate it. So Ruth is going to uh, log out and log right back in. Uh, she should be here in just a moment. Um, this is certainly a time that you can stretch, you can uh, pet your cat, you can get a snack, you can adjust yourself. We'll definitely have tonight's session. Just give us a moment to get that audio connected. I know Jesse did this as a teacher. There was times when the buses were late and he had to... Uh, dance and entertain his students. Thank you, Tanya. That's a great uh, thought. Allie, chiming in. We appreciate Allie, you're on uh, sabbatical, I think, and you, you're joining us on a webinar like this. Thank you so much. That's true learning right there. Kelly, thank you for your thoughts.
all you folks who are up. Oh, I think I hear you. Yeah. Hey, I hear you. Okay. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Thank you so much for being patient I, and gracious. I, for this. I apologize to everyone. I'm constantly on radio, on TV, and I'm very versed in tech stuff. I have no idea what happened. You know, it's really okay, Professor. Uh, again, the, good, the good news is, is that all of these educators have been teaching in a hybrid or a virtual space for a long time. And believe me, they know the feeling when you're scrambling to figure out what the problem is. Yeah. So, all right. I will get started. And thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for coming. I know you're busy. I'm uh, happy to see a big contingent from uh, Los Angeles, which is where I'm from. So welcome to everybody. And uh, should I, Andy, should I get to my first? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. We're just going to dive right in. As the moderator, I'll bring you any questions that come into the chat. Okay, and I'm gonna, I see that you've got all kinds of comments in the audience chat, so every so often I'll pause and we'll we'll take some questions. So, so you know, I, I wanted to start with saying why I wrote this book and, uh, you know, what we talked, why I wanted to do a, a book immersing myself for several years in the minds of these strongmen and dictators. And I use the, just to define terms, I use the word strongman to refer to a subset of authoritarians. Um, and some of them are old fashioned dictators, which by which we mean, you know, the one party state, more 20th century, although you still have it in North Korea and some other places. Um, and, and these are heads of state who damage or destroy democracy, but they have an authoritarian style of rule and they use masculinity as a tool of political legitimacy. And we're gonna see how they use their bodies and stuff. So those are the, the like Bolsonaro in Brazil and Putin and, and Erdogan in Turkey and Duterte in the Philippines. And so, so many of the most geopolitically important nations are now ruled by these individuals. And I'm, I'm a historian by training and I wrote the book for a couple of reasons. Uh, I felt it was time to look back at the evolution of authoritarianism over a hundred years, starting with fascism. And that's my, um, one of my, that's my specialty. And I saw many of the signs and symbols and techniques of fascism coming back. And when you're in a period of uh, rising authoritarianism, history becomes a fraught subject. History becomes a, a subject that is at the center of, of much politics. And so we've been living in this intense revisionism about history and, and states um, legislating or trying to legislate what you can talk about, what can be history and what can no longer be mentioned. So from Putin, um, who now, like when I teach World War II, um, I always tell my students when we, the day we cover uh, the Nazi Soviet pact, and I say, you know, if I were in Putin's Russia, I wouldn't be able to, to mention it or I would be fined or I could be put in jail for mentioning the Nazi Soviet pact. Or, um, I'm, and I have the first slide, um, here's the Proud Boys, the far, far right extremists at a rally. And of course you have the rehabilitation of the Confederate the Confederacy. And, um, and of course we've seen since then all kinds of attempts to stop uh, people from talking about race in the classroom. And then this T-shirt says Pinochet did nothing wrong, which was reference to the Chilean dictator. And this is a kind of talking point. And it both means that he did nothing wrong because it was okay to kill and torture leftists, but it's also a whitewashing of history. And so what we see around the world today, and we see it in Poland, there's a lot of legislation to, um, to try and criminalize people who mention Polish complicity in the Holocaust. So the big point is it's a whitewashing of violence and it's an attempt to um, kind of censor history so that certain things are no longer mentioned. And, and this seemed you know, very egregious to me. So I wanted to write this history and, and restore, uh, I write about Pinochet's torture. Um, I wanted to restore this. this, this because I feel that this historical record is threatened. And I also want to kind of debunk some of the myths 
that keep people engaged in authoritarianism. For example, we hear Mussolini made the trains run on time or you know, Hitler built the, the Autobahn. And so this idea that these, these men are efficient and modernizing. And I wanted to, when I did the research, I wanted to show how much chaos and destruction these strong men and dictators actually cause. So they come in saying they're gonna drain the swamp, which was actually a phrase uh, invented by Mussolini like a hundred years ago. And then of course, they are extremely corrupt. So, so those were some of the intellectual issues. And then, of course, as somebody living in America, and when Trump came on the scene and started doing the loyalty oaths and the rallies, attacking the press, the whole kind of, a lot of the ideological basis that I'd seen in fascism, I, I was very alarmed. And, and so it's the first book, it came out in November 2020, it's the first book to put Trump in historical context. And it's not a work of comparison, I'm not saying Trump is like Mussolini, it's, it's an evolution. And so one of the things we'll, we'll talk about is, like for example with propaganda, what stays the same and what changes over a hundred years of these dictators and, and strong men. And I saw somebody um, wrote in there when you asked the question of, um, you know, what, how do we characterize a dictator? And one person said that it's when they're, you know, they try and govern only um, in their own personal interest. And this is this is a part of dictatorship and 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 new new. Today we don't have as many dictators. We have that's why I use the word authoritarians. But they all do the same thing. So if we take Trump. Now, Trump didn't have time to wreck democracy, but he never intended to govern as a democratic president with a small d. And his goals and his priorities had nothing to do with traditional governance, public welfare or bipartisanship. He was in office to meet certain personal goals, and he wanted to turn public office into uh, a, a machine for private profit profit and then foreign policy becomes privatized and make deals with other autocrats and this is very very typical so this is why he spent one out of three every three days golfing and so a lot of people would look at this and say well oh yeah trump's lazy all he wants to do is golf but what he's doing he was visiting trump branded properties one out of every three days in office he was promoting his own brand and so that's an example that might be familiar of turning public office into a mechanism for private profit. Um, so, so I saw these things going on, like the personality cult, which we'll talk about, which were very, very familiar to me. And so I wanted to uh, write this book to look at how these things changed. And um, so I also began with some questions. <laughs> Why do people believe these guys? And a lot of uh, audience members have written charisma, and we're going to talk about charisma. And how do they get people to buy into their agendas to the point of acting against their self-interest, which we certainly see with people who are um, refusing, you know, the dictates of science, right? Or people who say, oh, I didn't want to get a COVID test because I didn't want to displease Trump and add to his numbers. So you have you have all of all of these um psychological mechanisms that were very interesting to me. So the first, one of the first big points, I don't have a slide on it because it's a text thing, but there's, I, I isolated what I call the authoritarian playbook. And these are tools, they're interlinked tools that every leader uses. And so I isolated propaganda, virility or machismo, corruption, and violence. And then I also have chapters on resistance, how you can counter all of these things and how they fall. But so, for example, with corruption, the, one of the essences of authoritarianism is the ability to get away with things, right? To have no accountability, to have impunity. Um, and this connects to virility because a lot of these guys, um, even when they're first running for office, they will style themselves as men who get away with things, men who can commit violence. Like Trump came up and said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose any followers. And I thought, well, you know, 
a regular Democrat or with a small d doesn't say something like that. That's not what most people say, but that's what authoritarians say. And then you have propaganda where they style themselves and their personality cults collude with this, that they are the men who know best, that they are touched by, they have divine, you know, benediction. And so anything they do, including inciting violence, getting the public to see violence as necessary, and here we connect to the tool of violence, is accepted because it's all for the best of the nation. And so all of this is the, the they all intersect these tools. And so that's what the book is about. Each, each of these rulers from Pinochet in Chile up to um, Erdogan or Bolsonaro or Trump, how they use them. And if we think about it as an introduction to how things change and how things stay the same. So today they still hold rallies. They have, they certainly use censorship. They, they repress, they find a way to repress their critics, uh, including those who are in exile. They have personality cults. But because today, most of them are dependent on elections, because today there's fewer military coups um, than during the Cold War. And so you run for office. And because they're dependent on elections, the manipulation of information has become even more important. And that's why we think so much about disinformation and propaganda today. And so, but one thing that has come with the 21st century kind of um, propaganda playbook is Mussolini was about, in fascism, it was about, uh, let me go to the next slide. This was a slogan in fascist Italy. Mussolini is always right. And look at this, this is also kind of fascist uh, theater. Here, these are people at the bottom, and this is the entrance to an exhibit. And so you walked, you know, under these giant things, and then this was a he even gianter, an imperial eagle. Um, and this was on like a main street of Rome. So Mussolini had to be always right. And uh, in the 1930s, he banned the use of question marks in newspaper headlines. And he'd been a journalist, so he totally micromanaged the press. So that's very interesting, I found, that you can't have anything in, in, thrown into doubt in a fascist, in the old, old time fascist state. So no question marks in headlines that would make you wonder. Now, and it locks down meaning. But today, with the things that Putin does, for example, it's called the fire hose of falsehood. You just throw, you, you, it's not just uh, things you want people to believe, but you want to confuse people. You want to make people realize that they don't, you can't find out the truth. You don't know what the truth is. And so Putin and Trump and these people today, they create question marks around everything. So that's one thing. That's the effect of social media, of new media that's changed a bit. So I'll stop here and take some questions. Um, so, Andy, are you going to um, field some of the questions? I, I sure am, and we have a bunch of questions uh, queuing up, as you can imagine. Um, I, I will mention, and I, I hesitate to do this given our earlier struggles, but I, I think maybe your microphone might be scratching against your, your collar. We're hearing a little bit of feedback that way. Um, yeah, I'm actually not even using, yeah. um, I'm not using anything. I'm sorry about that. It's because. Okay. I'm afraid if I put it back in, you won't hear me. <laughs> You're exactly right. I would rather hear this. Silence. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, first question I'd like for you to address comes from um, comes from Stephen Cooper. Stephen is curious uh, and is requesting that you define what exactly fascism is within the larger context of authoritarianism. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I'll try and be very quiet with my movements, too, because that <laughs> creates feedback. So Mussolini, who founded fascism, he had really, in a way, the most succinct, um, succinct and best definition. He called it a revolution of reaction. And this, so fascism is, you know, classically a one-party state with a dictatorship, um, total control of the press, you know, no opposition. It's not like today you leave a pocket of opposition. But fascism came up after World War I as a kind of revolutionary movement um, 
that was, um, uh, you know, people who were veterans were its core and they didn't want to demobilize. And so the war turned inward onto the left um, and eventually in, in onto Jews as well. But so fascism was a revolution and Mussolini used to be a socialist. So it wanted to shake up everything. And uh, but what it really was doing was um, suppressing emancipation. And what I found from fascism up to today, these movements and these strongmen, they appeal at times when society's gone through a huge change, when there's been a lot of social progress, a lot of upheaval. Um, think about 2016, you had eight years of Barack Obama, you had legalization of same-sex marriage, you had all kinds of changes. And of course, Fascism came after World War I, where you had female emancipation, you had mass um, feeling among men who were, you know, there was so, so many men had died or they were disabled. And um, so there was a threatened, a sense of a threatened status for elites, but also for common people, that their privileges, their way of life was ending. And, and so fascism is this movement that harnesses the energies of revolution um, and, and eventually in classic fascism goes to imperial conquest, imperial expansion, but shuts down all emancipation that's been going on. So it takes women's rights away, you know, takes, uh, imposes racist ideologies. So, so that's the revolution of reaction. And, and it, it's a kind of um, paradox that sums up um, this kind of attraction of fascism, that you're going to shake everything up, and yet you're going to shut everything down. Great. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I've got a question that's actually come from several different participants. Um, this question, I'm going to reframe it and sort of combine them. Uh, both Jonathan and Thomasine are curious if if the sense of being a dictator uh, could apply to a woman, or is it, generally speaking, a, a male, a male-dominated um, structure? I mean, we there there have been women. I mean, we're talking in the modern. So, because for dictatorship, you you really need mass media. So it really is a uh, 20th century, 21st century phenomenon. Although you had obviously lots of female tyrants in the past in history. Um, yeah, and it's interesting that it's. It, this is why I felt that um, people did not take seriously the machismo part of authoritarianism, even though it's so out there. I'm going to show you, you know, pictures of Mussolini and Putin with no shirt on. But um, the machismo and the, the kind of, see, well, what I said before about how fascism appeals when there's been a perceived injury to male authority. And in European and American contexts, it's white male authority. But I also studied Gaddafi and Mobutu in the Congo. So sometimes it, it's not about the white, it's about but what the gender is what trumps it. It has to be the feeling that male authority is threatened. And, and so the machismo is very important here. Um, and, but I also, in the conclusion of my book, I, I think we will have a female-led authoritarian state in the future. One of like in France, um, Le Pen, uh, her movement, uh, she's polling just as well and sometimes better than Macron to be the next head of state. And if there, if that happens, um, you won't have Le Pen or whoever it's going to be taking her shirt off. So the machismo will work differently, but everything else will be the same. They'll be just as corrupt. They'll be just as violent against you know people of color and migrants, etc. So I don't think that um, it has to, it, it, although it, the historical configuration has been that only men and maleness has been part of this model of power that gets fetishized and ends up in these strong men states. I think that um, eventually we, these guys are aging too. So I think eventually you'll have a female leader. Interesting. Thank you. And I, because I can see the next slide, I'm going to bring this question and use it as a segue for you to continue with your presentation. This question comes from Andrew, and he asks if you include Hitler in this group of dictators, or was he different in some kind of way? Um, 
here. I'm going to go. No, Hitler, he's, he's in the book. And he, I mean, each of them has their quirks and each of them has their obsessions and so um, their particularities. And um, so in Hitler's state, it was the, the racial um, was way more pronounced than some other things. But Hitler's style of governance and some of the things I'm going to say, his personality cult, his construction of charisma, it was very similar. And, and he had a similar personality. They all have similar personalities, again, with individual particularities, right? But um, Hitler was somebody who had to have, you know, from an early age, he had to have total control. And he found early on that he had, he, he wasn't very talented as an artist, so he, he didn't get into the art academy. But what his real talent was, was haranguing people and using his voice to kind of control people. And so he would go on these like rants. And this is how actually he, he started his career within Nazism. Um, and, and so this mania for control, and once you're in power, it extends to control of bodies, especially female bodies, control of na national resources, and then you become a kleptocrat. So they have a mania for absolute subjection and control of everybody around them. And Hitler was typical in that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go uh, forward and then we'll pause a little bit and answer some more questions. Sure. So, um, so to, I just want to like quickly uh, take you through a few like um, uh, cr the chronology of the rule because it's this when they're running for office what's very interesting is that these tools of rule they don't wait to use them when they are already in office they start doing these things when they're running for office and by the way Hitler ran for office uh, Mussolini had to run for office and he and he and Hitler were appointed in the end but they all except for people coming in, in a military coup everybody has to run for office so so they start immediately doing, um, for example, they start attacking the press. And this is, a, if you want to think, well, is this person I'm observing a strong man on the rise? And there's certain things that they check. You know, they become, they, they glamorize lawlessness, like Trump boasting, you know, like who in their right mind would boast that they could shoot somebody when they've just started their presidential candidacy? That doesn't make any sense, except if you're a strong man. So they glamorize lawlessness, they associate themselves with violence, and they start attacking the press. And the reason they do this is that they're all very corrupt. And in fact, Hitler, they're thugs and criminals. And Hitler, of course, had been in jail for, for the beer hall putsch. Mussolini was a serial sexual assaulter, and he also knifed people. He was a total criminal. And, and then others of them, like uh, Berlusconi and Putin and Trump were under investigation at the time they ran for office. So they're all corrupt and violent. And the reason they attacked the press early on is that they need to turn public opinion against the press so that when evidence comes out of their wrongdoing, their corruption, they need their followers to already believe that the press are just partisan hacks. So that's one thing that they do. Um, and this, and this lawlessness, Duterte was the same. Duterte, in fact, is a very interesting, you know, horrible, interesting case where Duterte, when he's running for office, again, this, we have to get into this, their mentality and not be in a liberal democratic mentality to understand them. Because, you know, again, who in their right mind starts campaigning and says, you shouldn't vote for me because if I win, it's going to be bloody. You know, and Bolsonaro did the same thing, boasting about killing people, boasting about times when people were killed is a good thing. And, and this is, of course, to intimidate people even before the election happens. So, so that's something that's important to think about when they're, when they're coming up to power. And the other thing they do, which is very important, um, I'm going to go to the next slide. This is a... This is like, talk about cancel culture. So as they come up, they style themselves as the champions of um, outsiders. 
as extremist rogues, as people who are going to tell the truth that the establishment doesn't want told. And often that's a dem democracy is the establishment. So this is very interesting. This is a Nazi party poster. And Hitler uh, was banned by several German states. So he gets out of, uh, he goes to, to prison and he gets out of prison and he, he's, you know, he's, he's got Mein Kampf and no one wants to buy Mein Kampf. He's, he's kind of, Mussolini considered him a loser. He was, Hitler was adoring Mussolini and Mussolini didn't want anything to do with him. So he gets banned for, for speaking because of his hate speech by several, at the state, state's level. So the Nazis, what do they do? They turn this into a kind of cancel culture thing. They, they turn it into political capital as though only he has the truth and this truth is being silenced. And so they become like glamorous in this way. And the other thing they do early on, and of course then it gets institutionalized, it's very important here, we're gonna to get to charisma, that they forge direct bonds with the people. They, and rallies are them looking, you know, directly talking to their followers. That's very important. And then they use newsreels, they use radio. And then, of course, the media changes over time. And Trump had Twitter, Bolsonaro Twitter. But they have to have direct communications with their public. And this is how the authoritarian leader-follower bond forms. And this bond is key. They all have to have this leader bond. And... And so he cultivates them early on, right? And so I'm gonna just go through a couple of these slides. This is a rare color photo of Hitler once he's in power, seen from behind. And here's Mussolini in an early, um, this is before he was a dictator. And so look at how he's looking at the public. He, he's not smiling. <laughs> he's not interested in being friendly. He wants to intimidate and um, kind of, you know, bully them with his eyes. And so this is what they do. And so the charisma of the strongmen is it, it, it blends um, a charisma that many other types of people have. Like it, the charisma is this kind of, you know, quality that some people have that makes you want to, it draws you to them. So movie stars, all kinds of people, and you want to know more about them. Maybe you feel you, you are their friend and they, they're very approachable. So that's part of charisma. But the charisma of the strongman, which also has an appeal for the followers, is the idea that he can dominate you and that you're gonna find fulfillment being dominated by him and uh, that he can make you do his bidding. He can make you do what he wants. And that's very different than a sports star or a, a movie star. But that's the kind of charisma that then gets fetishized. And so they know this and they come in already with this. This is not a friendly stare that Mussolini. And, and it's very interesting that I discovered uh, during my research that many of the most successful dictators had a background in mass communications or entertainment. So Mussolini was a journalist. And Mobutu was a journalist. Um, Berlusconi was in TV, owned TV stations. Trump, of course, did TV. And they know how to use their voices. They know how to, how, they're actors, they're performers. And so Mussolini really wrote the template for this. And it's relevant because these techniques get used today. So he was constantly stripping his shirt off. This is his summer, winter version. And then here's the summer version. And then he, the, the body of the dictator becomes, or the strongman, becomes an emblem of the nation. And they don't all take their shirts off, but they reconcile tradition and modernity. They become really, um, they, they pose them, they market themselves as rep, not only representing the nation, but literally embodying the nation. So this is interesting. This is Mussolini. It's from a newsreel where he, stripped off his shirt on camera, which was very star-like, very Devo-like. And he starts to thresh wheat, which is a very ancient peasant act. But he's not wearing the traditional hats. He's wearing these like state-of-the-art goggles. So he's kind of modern and he's also traditional. 
And so one of the points I want to make is that charisma, a lot of them work very hard to have this charisma and they market themselves. They, and their propaganda, um, uh, you know, the, the people who do their propaganda studied advertising like Goebbels in Nazi Germany. He studied advertising and marketing techniques. And of course, Trump was a marketer. So this charisma, um, it's not necessarily a natural thing. It's cultivated and, and it works like a charm. So um, let me just go in one more. And this is Hitler. So as we know, Hitler came to prominence because of his way of speaking, his voice screaming at people, but also his gestures. And he seemed to people to express their own emotions about Germany's future, about German humiliation, Germany's dreams. But, and we think, oh, quote, he's a natural. But Hitler, when he was having trouble, this is, you know, he's getting his speech bans, he can't speak, nobody's buying Mein Kampf. He decides to practice becoming a performer. So he hires a hypnotist, a coach, he hires a voice coach, he hires an acting coach, and he hired a photographer to help him practice his gestures in the mirror. So this is an incredible photo of that. And then finally, we have Modi, who um, is a very skilled um, performer who Instagrams his life. His, his main thing is Instagram. And so all of them know how to take the most advanced technology of their time and use it to build these bonds with their followers directly. So Modi, when he was campaigning in 2014, he used holograms to be present at up to 100 rallies at the same time and yet seem to be there in person because this personal connection that followers feel is why followers become so devoted. And one of the saddest things about um, strongman history is that once people bond to these guys, the bond stays there no matter what they say or do, no matter what disaster befalls the nation, no matter how many people perish of coronavirus, they don't give up the bond. Um, it, and in World War II, it took Italy and Germany being bombed by the Allies to finally start um, the cult of Mussolini and Hitler started to decline. So it's just a little bit of, we can, we can take some more questions, but I just wanted to show you these, it's the, the body, and this goes back to the person asking about, can women, mm -hmm. can women be strong men? It, and historically the male body and the presence of the male has been really, really important. Thank you. Let's let's pause. We have a bunch of questions that have come in, um, and and I'm going to offer this next question again to try to explore the nuance of of what you've uh, described in this kind of toxic toxic masculinity. This question comes from Jonathan, and he asks if a person from a minority group can become dictator of a majority. For example, could a black man running a white majority nation be a be a dictator? Um. That's an interesting question. Um, you, I mean, you can, if you know how to present yourself as the, if you know how to nationalize yourself and become the emblem of the suffering of the nation, in theory, you could. So, for example, in um Africa, like Sub-Saharan and, and North Africa, where there's a lot of um, uh, tribal social life has revolved around tribes. And many of the dictators came up as, um, like Gaddafi was from a Bedouin family. They were very poor, um, they were nomads, and they, were, they didn't have much status in, in Libyan politics at all, quite the contrary. And yet he he used that to make himself the voice of the suffering Libyans who were oppressed by elites. And so he, this poor Bedouin, became dictator of all and emblem of the reborn Libyan nation. So what your question is, it's, that's, an ex, 
that's an extreme case in a sense. I've never seen it um, historically, but you see that a lot of these guys are, um, what's the word? Um, not outcasts, but they, rep they sometimes represent um, marginalized parts of the population and they turn that into political capital. Thank you. Uh, this question comes from Thomas. Thomas is joining us from Los Angeles Unified. He's wondering if fascists are always or more likely to be socially conservative in that way, since they come up in times of change that society struggles with, or, or are they more likely to be progressive because they try to impart change that society wants, but do so in a way that consolidates control? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the thing about strongmen is that they manage to be all things to all people. Mm. And so take Mussolini, who was a revolutionary, but he also was, was a total reactionary. Or, um, you know, and, and the magic of these strongmen because of charisma and the bonds and their performance is that they can say one thing to one group of supporters in the morning and the opposite to another group, and still it all holds together. And so um, they tend to have these very eclectic bases where you have gangsters and priests and people who have nothing in common, but um, they they are in love with the strong man and see that he is the only one that can bring the nation to greatness. And and so, but what you're talking about also is that most of these men, with some exceptions for characters like Franco or Pinochet, come from the army. Many of them are um, highly destructive, and they see themselves as revolutionaries. But how do they actually get into power? It's conservative elites who bring them in. And this is another theme that, of the book, over and over, and history rather, over and over, it, the, it's the conservative elites who sometimes, uh, and this is kind of a sad thing, and the most famous cases in Germany with Hitler, they think that they're going to use, they see this like, this very charismatic, um, slightly crazy, outsider who's vastly popular and they invite him in thinking they're going to control him so that they can keep their own privileges because they're worried that their own privilege their own wealth their own racial superiority is threatened by changes and then of course not only they don't control him he ends up controlling them and what's What's really interesting, this didn't just happen with the fascists, because the same thing happened in Italy. Even when there's a coup, I have, this This was fascinating in Chile. So coup, there is no, it's just it was a military coup. There was no elites inviting anybody in. And yet the Christian Democrats, who were the conservatives of the day, they actually thought that they um, they bat they decided to back Pinochet, even though he caused all this bloodshed and you know upheaval and mass imprisonments, because they thought that he could restore order and then he would give them back government and restore democracy. That's and it sounds very naive to us, but the reason they back them is that they're afraid. You often they're afraid of the left, and they want to keep their privileges. So. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's one person who acts both as a destroyer and as a conservative. Other times it's somebody who's out there and conservatives ally with him. Uh, one final question before we move on. And unfortunately, as the timekeeper, uh, I need to remind us we have about a half an hour left. This uh, next question, last question in this segment comes from Adriana. Adriana is joining us from South Carolina. And she's wondering if you can talk a little bit about the purging of the political elite for remaining and consolidating power. Uh, for example, the big purges in the Soviet Union, Iraq, Syria, et cetera. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, okay, and that gets me um, to something I wanted to talk about anyway. So they, one of the things that really struck me is that all of them set up similar um, systems of governance, and I don't mean um, at the big level with one party states, but they all end up having this kind of inner sanctums around them. And they, 
because of their their bullies and be, but they're actually very fragile and they're paranoid. A lot of them, like certainly Stalin, was paranoid, and so they they can only have around them flatterers and sycophants and often family members. So I have a paragraph about sons-in-law from Mussolini to today, like you know Erdogan and Orban, and of course we had Jared Kushner. You have family and flatterers um, because those are the only people who can be around. And because dictators and strongmen are, they know that they know how corrupt they are. They know all their own secrets. They they get very they are constantly haunted by somebody taking their power away. So this is why their um, their governments resemble like uh, revolving doors, where they're constantly uh, in a. If it's still a democracy like Berlusconi and Trump, they're hiring and firing people. If it's uh, Saddam Hussein and it's a real dictatorship, they are sending people to prison or executed. So the, the loyalty quotient with elites around them, ev nobody's ever safe. And this is the this is a very important part of the authoritarian mentality. If you want to stay in power, you have to make sure everybody understand everybody lives in fear. And so the purges of elites, they're a function of that, but they're also uh, this principle that when there are and this is really for old fashioned dictatorships, they never become more mild, they always become more extreme. Because the logic of stealing and thieving, remember they're stealing, they're all of them are stealing all of the resources, they're enslaving the people. The fear of resistance and popular turmoil and the need for more and more money and more and more properties, et cetera, drives them to become more, um, more extreme. And so then the circle of people who you have to keep purging widens. Um, and and it's very it's just very interesting because we lived through the, in the Trump presidency. Of course, it's nothing like Stalin or in Mao. It's nothing like that. No one that would be weird to to say it is. But the 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 hiring and firing and the institution of loyalty quotients and the and the theater where Trump would make people, including Mike Pence, you know, sing his praises in public. This this is what you even in a democracy you see these psychological dynamics unfolding and then when you have a real dictatorship like stalinism a real totalitarian you end up with the purges and the terror um, that you mentioned great thank you so why don't we go ahead and uh and move through the conclusion of your slides and then we'll save all the other questions for the end Okay, um, I don't, let me see. Yes. So, okay, what I, the, so we, we'll just leave the slides um, to themselves for a while. And I want to talk about how they fall. And we've already, so we're getting that the last question get, gets us to, to this uh, topic well, because the more that they stay isolated in their cocoon, the more they have to repress their people, the more they have to have more propaganda, more repression of every type. Um, it reinforces their worst tendencies because um, they only have people, nobody can tell them the truth around them. So they start to believe their own propaganda. And that is when they make very bad decisions. And a contemporary example is uh, Lukashenko in Belarus. So, you know, recent, so there were mass protests and they marched on his presidential palace. And uh, Belarus, a lot of the young generation is, they hate him and he knows it. So he did this whole show where he, you know, flew in a helicopter and buzzed the protesters and then he landed for the cameras and he had, you know, a, a machine gun in his hand. And then he became, and this, but this, this uh, made him, this really um, affected him that these mass protests. So he became more reckless 
And that's when he hijacked the plane to get to the journalists in exile. So they do, they start, if they feel their power is threatened, they start behaving in very dangerous and reckless ways that often involve um, sometimes foreign, you know, going to conquer somebody or just doing a stunt, which was a very deadly stunt with hijacking an airplane. And um, psychologically speaking, it's it was it's a very it's a they're very interesting people to study um, because the authoritarian playbook doesn't have any chapter on failure, and democratic heads of office see their departure from office as inevitable. They're going to in the in the states they're going to have their presidential library, but authoritarians they fear immunity losing immunity from prosecution. They fear the loss of adulation. They cannot, and they've, if they've been there a long time, they literally cannot imagine not having control of everyone and everything. So they are really unprepared to for the way down. And so they start purging more, et cetera, what we already said. So they actually start, um, there's even political scientists have a term called gambling for resurrection. It's when It's when dictators who are on the way down do things like starting a war, or if they're in a war, they go further into the war, or they um, have a self-coup, which is when you're in office and you try and stay in office. So they do desperate things, and they become um, much more unstable. And so we, again, we had a little of this with Trump, and I had to turn in my book in the summer, and I had time to uh, write about uh, Black Lives Matter in the summer, but I didn't know who would win the election. But I was able to predict in the book that Trump wasn't going to leave quietly. There was just no way he was going to leave um, without a fuss. And it's very interesting because what he did actually drew from during that very long, exhausting period after the election, he it drew from all of the eras of authoritarian history because he tried to have the military um, have a coup and that didn't work because General Millet didn't go along with it. And then he tried what um, Erdogan and Putin, this is how authoritarianism works today, where you, you manipulate elections. You, if you have results you don't like, you declare them fraudulent. And that's still going on with the GOP. This is the big drama of, of our age right now, that you know all the voter suppression, but also trickery, threatening voters, you know, threatening election workers. So we tried that. And none of it worked. And so he went for um, the violence, right? So he had an armed attack. And what I, this was the last slides, which, what was so frightening for me as a historian of fascism, this is the rally um, before the assault on the Capitol. And they showed a propaganda film. And the last frame of the film, and it stayed up there as everybody left to go and assault the Capitol. Um, was his face, was a close-up of Trump's face. And so this is leader cult. And so January 6th was many things, but it was also um, an operation to rescue the leader. So it was an authoritarian cult operation. And um, I'm going to put this, this creeps me out, so I'm going to put it back to something. There we go. He's, he's, and this is another theme we didn't get to talk about this, the religious institutions. But um, so their, their, their falls from power are very dramatic, and they also uh, watch what happens to each other, and, um, and so it never ends well. Professor, as you could imagine, there are a lot of questions that are closely aligned with the last comment you just made, which... Uh, frankly, uh, was was a little bit of a downer. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Whenever I'm on TV, the the hosts yeah. are like, "Oh, you're depressing us." <laughs> People want to know, and there are a lot of questions. I'm going to distill them all into sort of a single question, and then we've got some others to ask. But uh, many of our participants, as you can imagine, uh, Rashid and um, and Ali and uh, and and others are asking. Uh, Adriana are asking, you know, how how optimistic are you? Is is democracy broken? Um, what what can we do to to turn this back, to turn this around? Is is it too late? 
tell us a little bit about um, how you see this moving forward. So to, to end on a positive note, um, one thing that in doing, writing about 100 years of resistance, um, there, there's a huge power in nonviolent mass protests. And we saw it in our country with Black Lives Matter, which was, and we can never forget this, the largest social mobilization in American history. And it happened during a pandemic. And, and then the election, uh, not only there was not widespread violence around the election in 2020, but uh, Trump was voted out. And um, so I'm just using the example of America. But mass protest um has at the right time it has a really important effect not only um i'm thinking of when you have authoritarian states it's not only directed at the leader but it sends a message if enough people are out in the streets it sends a message to the elites who back him and to the foreign enablers we didn't have time to, to talk about all the international law firms and the banks all the people who prop these guys up from, from other countries. And they see that his days are numbered. Um, and that energy of protest, it's, you can repress it for a while, but it comes back in the end. Um, and so the history of protest um, is, is very moving. I found it very moving to study it. Mm. And of course, one of the roles of an historian is to look at those long trends over time and to see how these classic examples can inform uh, these contemporary um, examples. Um, a couple of folks have noted and are curious about how and why you identified the figures in your book that you did. So maybe as a as a counter to that question, I'm gonna what I'd like to do is mention to you several names that we haven't talked about yet tonight. And if you can just respond uh, briefly your perspective of each of them as they fit into this 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 archetype of a dictator as you've described it. So the first one comes from Rashid. Rashid is joining us from Morocco. And Rashid is wondering, um, how, what are your feelings about uh, Nasser in Egypt? Mm. Um, yeah, Nasser, Nasser was really, so there was a whole season of anti-colonial, uh, many of them ended up being military coups and social revolutions. And Nasser was extremely important as uh, this kind of figure of Arab liberation, but became a model for uh, other areas of the world as well. Um, and he, you know, he, he kind of, in a milder way, he um, sums up this kind of dy dynamism or this process whereby the liberator, once they're in power, can become a bit repressive. But Nasser was important not only for what he did, um, with pan-Arabism, but he was very influential on Gaddafi um, and other other dictators who were way more repressive than than he was. Thank you. Uh, how about uh, this name, uh, Omi uh, Bab? I'm sorry, Bahiba. Is that correct? Tell, tell me how to pronounce it. Uh, the Indian uh, physicist in the early 20th century, Baba. Uh Oh, I'm not. I'm. I can't really speak about. Okay, that's him. Uh, that's cool. Thank you. Um, this is from Brennan. How about Fidel Castro? Yeah. So, so what I, you know, every as, as you know, your teachers and you, you use a lot of uh, materials and you have to organize them in some way. And what I decided to do in my book, um, I would have loved to write about Castro, um, but. I wanted, to, I decided to, I have Gaddafi in there because he's so connected to a lot of right wing figures, but I decided to focus on fascists and their inheritors of right wing authoritarians. So I have like Franco and Pinochet up to Bolsonaro and Trump. That meant that I don't write about, I don't write about Stalin. So I didn't do communists. I don't have China and I don't have Castro. But Castro um, also, very important internationally. Um, he was funding, you know, he was funding a lot of um, uh, resistance to the military juntas during the Cold War. But he, yes, he had this incredible, you know, he was very charismatic um, and uh, he fits 
he fits all of the qualities of the strongman, including the cultivation of the image and the machismo, all of it. Um, and again, I, I, I would have loved to write about him, but I, I had to, I decided to do this through line of right wing authoritarianism. So he didn't mm -hmm. fit in. Thank you. Um, this question comes from Tisha. Tisha is joining us from Connecticut. And she would like you to talk a little bit more about the religious connections. Um, Mussolini did have the support of the Catholic Church. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that, that connection generally. Yeah, it's really important. Um, and and it, one of the ironies, there's many ironies in the history of these guys, is that sometimes it's the most um, impious, profane individuals who, because of their personality cults, their charisma, managed to be the ones to ally with religious institutions. And so Mussolini wasn't just a former socialist. He was a total atheist. He was so anti-clerical. But he was the one, because they're transactional. This is the principle here. They are transactional. They're opportunists. And they will ally with anyone. They don't, they don't really, they're amoral. So they don't, they don't limit who they would ally with based on their morals, because they don't have any morals. So Mussolini was the one who ended up solving the church state and, and created the Vatican, you know, independent Vatican. And the same with Trump is the last person in theory, you know, serial sexual assaulter, money launderer, you know, on and on so many crimes. He's the last person one would think that Orthodox Jews and evangelical Christians. And also there's a huge non-denominational Christian churches that are pro-Trump. Um, it's larger than evangelicals. And they all see, they've chosen to see in him as, you know, the person who is going to save the nation. And he's delivered for them. He's delivered very well through his, he really it set off a kind of right wing, white supremacist cultural revolution, Christian, and did a lot of things inside the government to support um, Christian values and priorities, which are now being continued in places like Texas. So these are very powerful alliances, and Putin has the Russian Orthodox Church. He's restored a ton of uh, churches in Russia. Um, you know, he's he patronizes the church financially in all ways, and so all a lot of the most successful ones have um, alliances with, with religion, and that helps them to seem legitimate and desirable and positive for a lot of um, followers. Thank you. Uh, one more question and then a final question. Uh, this question comes uh, from a post-colonial perspective. Um, can you talk a little bit about why we have democracy and empire simultaneously working together? Are those, are those compatible? Um, I mean, <laughs> so a, a quick story is um, Mobutu, who was a real charmer, a deadly, deadly charmer, he, when, when Americans and other Democrats would chide him for his human rights abuses, he would always say, well, what about, I learned everything from the Belgians, the Belgians were the dominators of Congo. And he said, well, wasn't the Belgians to start concentration camps? So he would put it back in Europeans' faces that, that European colonialism, which unfolded during, you know, democracies was incredibly brutal right so um yeah so that's that's um the, that's something that um uh d democracy has well, authoritarianism has no monopoly on cruelty on plunder but democracies uh, often uh did it externally and didn't turn it on their own people mm. Thank you. Uh, last question tonight, Professor, goes to Andy in Chapel Hill. Uh, that's me. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about premeditation. Um, you know, calling this the authoritarian playbook definitely implies that there's a, a script or, a, or a, a cocktail recipe that you can follow, that one can follow to, uh, to gain this kind of control and to, to be a dictator. 
Um, talk to us a little bit about premeditation versus instinct, because you know, hearing as you've described these characteristics and the examples you've given, it also seems very feral and very, uh, as you described, opportunistic and um, impulsive. How much premeditation goes into uh, the figures that you've shared with us tonight? Is, is this an intentional script or is this the personality that is just um, sort of naturally finding these kinds of um, these kinds of frictions because that's what the personality does? Yeah, that uh, that's one of the questions I get asked most often. It's a great question. It's like it's a meeting of the right circumstances and this type of personality. Mm-hmm. And one of one of the so they do study each other. They do learn from each other. They really do. Hitler studied Mussolini. Um, they so that there is that kind of premeditation. Right now, Bolsonaro is imitating Trump, trying to have his own little January six type thing. But there, each of the sad thing about this is almost all of them are end up being very surprised of how much success they have because they're kind of inventing it as they go along, precisely because they're opportunists. They are they are be, because they have no morals. They can take advantages of of moments of opportunity that come up in a culture at a time, and they will nothing will prevent them from taking it all the way. And so, so Trump found that it was important to lie all the time and to do certain things and people followed him and then he kept doing them. And so they're not constrained by morals. So in that sense, it's instinct, but they also do admire each other. They look at what each other's done and they learn from each other, both successes and failures. Professor, thank you so much for sharing your insights tonight. Your book is wonderful. We appreciate the the time that you spent with us. And while these are stark insights, they're also necessary for us to find that resistance piece that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for the third episode of the Humanities of Class webinar series. Uh, We're very pleased that you could spend uh, the, the last 90 minutes with us. And I hope that you take some time to review the resources that we've added to the folder As I mentioned in the chat box, the recordings of tonight's session, as well as the PowerPoint, will be available in the next couple of days in that same space. Please do pay attention to the social media uh, outlets at the Humanities Center. Our email listserv, our Facebook page, and our Twitter uh, regularly have updates on all of our uh, virtual and face-to-face events and activities. And I hope that uh, you're able to join us sometime in the near future. That could, in fact, be next week. Uh, September 14th is our next webinar. I'll be joined by Christopher Jones from Arizona State University to talk about energy policy. Now, you know, when I put together the season, usually about a year in advance, I rely on a lot of different um, uh, instincts of my own and and, uh, recommendations from educators and gaps that I I am sensing in the curriculum. Uh, This particular webinar specifically came from uh, the power outage in Texas last winter when through a very intentional series of policies, both social and political, uh, the power grid failed. It was within minutes of being lost forever, it seems. Uh, What Dr. Jones will do is uh, share his insights on uh, the history of energy in the 20th century and the ways that that is more than us just plugging uh, something into the socket, that there's a wide variety of layers behind it. Hope you can join us. It's next week on September 14th. Please have a great day at school tomorrow. Weekend's almost here. We'll see you next time at the Humanities to Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.